Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Candidate Forum for the position of Mayor, City of Portland in the November general election. My name is Debbie Kay. I'm president of the League of Women Voters and the moderator for today's forum. The League of Women Voters believes that democracy works best when voters are engaged in their communities and informed about voting. The League is resolutely nonpartisan. We're presenting this forum to give Portland voters the opportunity to learn more about the candidates for mayor, Sarah Ayanaron and Ted Wheeler. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot hold in-person uh, candidate events. I'm joining you from the studios of Metro East Community Media in Gresham, and the candidates are joining us from their own locations. We are grateful for the support of the Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fruing Fund, and Metro East Community Media. And now for the forum rules. The candidates may each give two minute opening statements, and then they will each have 90 seconds to answer the questions that we have prepared, and each will also have a two minute closing. Sarah and Ted, I do request that you adhere to the allotted times. As determined by the coin toss, Ted Wheeler will give the first opening statement and we will alternate the answers. So let's get started. Ted, please go ahead with your two minute opening. Good morning, thank you. I know everybody's asking the same question and it's a tough question. Can Portland be saved? And will things get better? Will the leaders of this city step forward and boldly lead us through the crises that are facing us at this time? The COVID crisis, the economic crisis, the national demands for racial justice and equity, the continued homeless crisis we're seeing on this street. And on a personal note, people are asking clearly, am I the right person to lead this city going forward? I want to assure you, I believe that I am. I know this is a very, very difficult time for Portland families. I hear that. And my administration is redoubling our efforts to get us through the crisis. I've also heard the frustration the Portland families are experiencing around the need for urgency. And I hear those calls as well. And I acknowledge the need for that urgency and we're redoubling our efforts. And we are rising to the occasion. I'm proud of the work that my administration has done to address the crisis, working with my colleagues on the Portland City Council and other people in the community. On COVID, we led early and aggressively to stop the spread of the COVID virus. We were the first to organize to get dollars out the door to families in need and to small businesses to help them get through the crisis. And we led with equity from day one. Of the first $2 million that went out the door, 90% went to businesses owned and operated by people of color. And of course, we worked hard to protect the vulnerable in our community. I acknowledge that we have to keep going. I love this community. I was born and raised here. I raised my daughter here and it's in my DNA. And I'm you. asking you to continue to support my leadership during this time of crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, please go ahead with two minutes. Thank you very much. And thanks to the League of Women Voters for putting this on. I appreciate your contributions to ensuring a healthy democracy uh, for our city, region, and state. Yes, my name is Sarah Ayanaron, and I am running for Portland Mayor, in large part because the failures uh, that our city is experiencing are not um, the fault of the incumbent mayor alone, but the lack of urgent leadership and responsiveness to the solutions is. And what we're seeing right now is a high level of um, dissatisfaction where an overwhelming majority of voters are unhappy with what they've seen from the incumbent. And yet we're faced with the challenge of, do we want four more years of this? My answer is that we cannot uh, endure four more years of this. And in fact, the responses to COVID are too little too late. When you look at how we have been faced with the inequality uh, in the wake of this pandemic that was there long before COVID arrived. We've seen a revolving door of police chiefs on his watch and sluggish attempts to reform the police. And now we have 
uh, over 100 nights of protest, night after night, with increasing police brutality, um, even as the public demands overwhelmingly that Black Lives Matter. Uh, we've seen the ongoing crisis of homelessness, and despite the claims with regard to solutions, it does not pass the eye test. What we're seeing is increased um, lack of resources in the streets. People are struggling and we need more community-based solutions to what's going on. What we've seen is a mayor who has tried to go it alone rather than operating in community, someone who doesn't really trust in the power of community to lead on solutions and ultimately has lost the faith of community because when you don't listen to community, tap into community and believe in community, then community won't be there for you when you need them. And one thing that we know as Portlanders is that community is our greatest asset. And so Thank I I come from a background I need of a to small cut business. Oh, okay, Thank we can you. continue. Sorry. No worries. I don't have a clock, so I'll try to set one. All right. I will. Would you like me to cue you? Uh, no, I'll just set a clock. So I All can right. Um, our first question, which will go to you, Sarah, if elected, specifically, what would be your top three priorities as mayor? So... I laid out when I launched this campaign last July, three priorities, uh, climate justice, housing affordability, and racial equality. And what we've seen is that is the exact framework that the current crises demand. So as we work toward a just transition off the fossil fuel economy, making investments in clean, green jobs is going to be important. Unlike the incumbent, I supported the Portland Clean Energy Fund from day one. Um, he actively opposed that with the Downtown Business Association uh, initially, and then later took credit for that. Um, I've consistently shown up for housing issues where we need to look at how we can increase the supply of affordable housing all across the city, even as we're working hard to protect tenants' rights, uh, preventing displacement, and making sure that our schools are shored up so that we don't have high displacement and high turnover rates at many of our Portland public schools. And ultimately, when it comes to racial justice and the staggering inequality that so many BIPOC Portlanders face, and also other Portlanders uh, from the disability community, um, from immigrant and refugee communities, LGBTQ communities, what we need to look at is inequality that's plaguing our city as a hidden tax on our people, uh, uh, tackling it directly through uh, concerted strategic investments, um, better bureau coordination, and ultimately clear measures that let us know how we're making progress and when so that we as policymakers can be held accountable both for our successes and for our failures. Thank you. Ted, if elected, specifically what would be your top three priorities? 90 seconds, please. My top three priorities haven't changed. Number one, getting us through the COVID crisis and the resulting economic downturn. Number two, addressing the homeless crisis on our streets. And uh, we do have obviously a lot more work to do on that front, but I'm proud of the work that we've done with the county and the joint office and others to begin to address the chronic homeless situation on our streets by getting people not only off the streets and into appropriate housing, but also connect them with the services they need to get off and stay off the streets. And third, shared economic prosperity. No administration has ever led with equity the way mine has around economic prosperity in terms of the developments we're doing, like the Broadway Corridor, where we now have the city's first community benefits agreement, or the work that we've done around the Inclusive Business Resource Network or my Portland Means Progress initiatives that elevate and lift black entrepreneurs and workers in this community. And Sarah is mischaracterizing my stance on the Portland Clean Energy Fund. I didn't oppose the values or the goals. I opposed the fundraising mechanism, which was flawed. And after it passed, I worked with Commissioner Hardesty and people in the business community and the proponents of that ballot measure to fix those problems. That's the kind of problem solving approach I will continue to bring to the job if I'm reelected. Thank you. Our next question, uh, which we'll start with you, Ted. COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and caused losses of many kinds for so very many Portlanders. How do you think the pandemic will impact the city budget? For example, service cuts for the city, are they inevitable in the next few years? What criteria would you use to determine which services to cut and the amount to cut? There's no question it impacts the city's budget. For the first time after careful financial planning for three budget cycles, 
we were going into this budget year expecting no reductions for any bureaus. That would have been the first time in about 10 years that that happened. COVID hit and we had a $75 million hole blown in our budget. We prioritized equity in that budget. We prioritized protecting frontline services to the community and we prioritized our vulnerable populations by guaranteeing that we would continue to provide the same amount of support to the Joint Office of Homeless Services to help our neighbors who are on the streets. And because of that, we were able to reduce the budget. Uh, I took, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working for free. I asked my employees to take a, a haircut along with me. They did. We've been able to balance the budget substantially based on that, protecting not only the jobs at the city of Portland, but the frontline services. And that's how we're gonna to continue to prioritize jobs, economic prosperity, protecting vulnerable populations, and making sure our frontline services continue to get supported in the community. Thank you. Same question to you, Sarah. Would you like me to repeat it? It's a long one. Yes, could you please? Sure. As COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and caused so many losses, how do you think the pandemic will impact the city budget? For example, uh, might there be service cuts? Are they inevitable? And what criteria would you use to determine which services to reduce and the amount to cut? This is an instance where we need to uh, resist the impulse toward the austerity mindset and really focus on what the role of local government is and how we want to spend our money. What we've seen uh, year after year on the incumbent is increased to the Portland police budget, even though now we're hearing from him that he's going to keep that funding flat. There are not commitments from him to significantly reduce that further. And in fact, I believe that uh, he's committed to maintaining that uh, funding for the Portland Police Bureau. What I'm hearing from the public is that they would actually like us to decrease uh, funding to the Portland Police Bureau and reallocate uh, those resources more wisely, uh, more effectively on things like Portland street response and making sure that we're uh, setting up temporary shelters for people who are experiencing homelessness, making sure that we have things like community safety hubs uh, for families who are facing poverty, uh, making sure that we have our community prepared uh, for the wave of evictions that are pending uh, potentially as the moratorium lifts. We need to think carefully about not throwing good money after bad. What we've seen even prior to COVID was things like cuts to the parks budget where we we're cutting parks workers, even as we were increasing police funding. So this isn't something that's just COVID dependent. It's something that we need to think about as a community. So that's why I propose participatory budgeting uh, uh, in my good government plan, which people can find at sarah2020.com slash good government, where we can actually you, start sorry, to make budgeting. Running. You're running, you're running over. Thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. Our next question, we'll start with you. I'll, I'll remind you both question answers um, have 90 seconds and um, I will raise a finger at 30 seconds and offer stop at five. Local businesses are facing a multitude of challenges this year. How can the city help our businesses and their employees survive these challenges and move forward to thrive again? This is such an important question. The small business that I founded back in 2006 actually went under due to COVID. Uh, my daughter lost her job there. So my family has uh, directly experienced the impacts of this uh, as has my neighborhood because that was an investment in our community uh, that was prosperous for some time and helped us bring people together. And I understand the value of making sure that our neighborhood small businesses are cared for. Uh, I understand that there are also uh, demands from the downtown business community to make sure that we have a rapid recovery from COVID. So this is why I have proposed um, a key liaison in the mayor's office who will do the, be the strategic lead for the recovery on the small business side. This director of small business and entrepreneurship will be tasked with uh, coordinating whatever efforts and assistance are coming into our city from whatever level, making sure that our investments are targeted and also making sure that we're being held accountable through good data collection and reporting so that we know that we're having the effective impacts, especially in our BIPOC community so that entrepreneurs and small business owners um, have access Access, not just to capital assistance, uh, but technical assistance and lobbying assistance. Thank you. Same question to you, Ted. Do you want me to repeat it? 
Nope, I remember. it. So uh, first of all, Portland is a small business economy. About 80% of the people who live in Portland work for small businesses. So that, that is clearly where our efforts are focused. During the COVID recovery, $20 million went out the door initially to help small businesses survive the economic downturn. And we just added a $12 million grant fund that we also think will help small businesses to be able to sustain this downturn and ultimately recover. We thought long and hard at the city level about how we contract for services because we are major purchasers of services in the city of Portland. And so we've changed our contracting standards to include not only more small businesses, but also to focus on the equity issues that are so important for our shared economic prosperity. Then there's the specific initiatives like the Inclusive Business Resource Network that provides technical assistance to about a thousand small businesses a year. Uh, as well as cleaning up the city. I, I did a walk through Old Town Chinatown with business leaders the other day. They want us to do more around litter collection, graffiti abatement, and public safety. And my administration is committed to new initiatives in all of those areas. So we'll continue to do it. Thank you. Our next question, which starts with you, Ted. Uh, if the city charter amendment authorizing a new independent police oversight board, oversight board passes in November, what would be the mayor's role in advocating for the needed changes to state laws? How would you? Use, thank you. Um, how would you use negotiation for the next police department contract as a way to carry out the voters' will? Yeah, sorry, I jumped the gun on that. I apologize. Um, so there, there's actually multiple obstacles. First of all, uh, just, just so everybody knows what we're talking about, the city council referred to the November ballot a overhaul of our police oversight and accountability mechanism. The goal is to take us back to the intent of the charter, which is to have civilian oversight of policing. And uh, at this point, I think people are pretty clear that both collective bargaining agreements by previous city councils and state statutes stand in the way. So I'm already working with all of my colleagues on the city council around a stronger negotiation uh, series with the Portland Police Association. For the first time ever, we've hired outside counsel to lead that effort. Accountability and oversight is not only our top priority, the community in our community forums indicated that was their top priority. We're also working with the POC caucus down in Salem at the state legislature to uh, I understand that there are a number of state statutes which stand in the way of us being able to implement a robust local uh, initiative around oversight and accountability, and they've committed to working with us. So we're on track. I believe the next step is up to the voters. Please, in November, vote for the initiative around police accountability and oversight on your local ballot. Thank you. Sarah, the same question to you. Do you want to hear it again? No, I can answer from here. Thank you very much it's pretty clear what needs to happen in terms of making sure that the community has a say in how policing unfolds in this city. I think the question here for voters is who do they trust more to be able to bring that about? Someone who has failed to heed community calls time and again to rein in uh, what's relatively rogue police force compared to how our other city employees uh, function in terms of oversight and accountability. Um, the fact that uh, both Commissioner Hardesty and the public have called uh, time and again for Commissioner Hardesty to be made police commissioner so that we have someone leading on these processes that we trust. Um, again, the mayor has failed to heed that call. A uh, time and again, what I see is an unwillingness to set the vision and goals in tandem with the community, trust the community uh, to know what it needs best, and then work with them to follow feasible plans that they craft to get there. Uh, ultimately, we are thinking of structural form. Cooperating with our colleagues in Salem is going to be important, but also we need to make sure that we're building the community power in the streets, and that's why as a publicly financed candidate, who has thousands of donors from every corner of the city, I believe I'm well equipped to build the community coalition that we need to bring about the real structural reforms uh, to policing that we need to see today and for future generations of Portlanders. Thank you. Our next question, um, we'll start with you, Sarah. Portland has a long history of protest, and this year the city has experienced many months of constant protests in support of Black Lives Matter and also some counter protests in support of the police, with the added challenge of violence. 
What has the city learned in the past several months that could influence its response to future protests? That's an interesting question because uh, the city with a capital C, sometimes it seems like they haven't learned as much as they need to. Uh, the city, we the people with a lowercase c, uh, has learned a lot about how to organize to make sure that we're getting outcomes that we need. We saw even just this Saturday where uh, the incumbent was uh, very uh, pleased with the outcome at Delta Park when we had Proud Boys, uh, white nationalists coming into our city. But then later that evening, uh, the Portland police absolutely brutalized uh, journalists in the streets uh, without consequence to this point. And the reason that I believe that we continue to have protests is because night after night, uh, police brutality uh, uh, unfolds at protests about police brutality. What we've learned as a community, as a city, is that we need to hold our elected officials accountable by organizing uh, week after week. What we've seen is movement on the police budget, movement on community oversight of policing, movement in terms of how we're going to achieve our shared goals. But what we haven't seen from the mayor's office is clear leadership. It took him a uh, hundred days to ban just one form of tear gas when we need to be banning all chemical weapons. Uh, we have not seen targeted arrests of the alt-right that we need to see. Uh, we have not seen violent officers uh, removed from protest duty. We have not seen um, enforcement of a ban on cooperation between the alt-right and Portland Police Bureau. And I'll go on and on. People can visit my website, my Rethinking Public Safety Plan, for my full thinking on that. Thank you. Um, Ted, same question to you. Well, I, I could spend 10 minutes correcting the record, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll just encourage people to, to be somewhat uh, skeptical about some of what they just heard. So first of all, we have heard the community, and there has been a defunding of the police. As you'll recall, I worked with my colleagues on the Portland City Council to not only refer this ballot measure around oversight and accountability, I myself put forward a 19 point specific plan around police reform based on what I'd heard from the community. We've already either enacted or have in process about 11 of those. We've committed to working with the state legislature on five additional ones. Previously, I'd already heard what the community said. They said they wanted more accountability and oversight. So I created the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, which even Sarah will have to admit has been very independent in their views. People said they wanted unarmed police on our streets. So for the first time ever, I created the Portland uh, Public Safety Support Specialist, the PS3 program. They are not armed. We've continued to make changes around non-law enforcement responses to community safety, to shift resources to the community, to increase equity and inclusion, not just at the police bureau, but in all of our operations. And then importantly, create opportunities and roads for the, the public to participate. And that's, that's the path we're on. Uh, it doesn't happen quickly or easily. There is collective bargaining and there are state statutes that we're working to change, but we're doing the dog work of good governance and we're plugging away at making these changes. And they're fundamentally more than any prior administration has ever done around Thank police reform. Thank you. Our next question, we'll start with you, Ted. And you've both talked some about homelessness and the challenges to our community, our whole community. Even as voters pass measures for housing and supportive services, the number of unhoused Portlanders, including those living on the streets, is growing. How can the mayor help ensure that all Portlanders have safe, stable housing? What additional strategies would you promote? Yeah, so our focus through the Joint Office of Homeless Services has been on prevention, so that's rent support for people who are particularly at risk of becoming homeless. It's around shelter creation, and we've more than doubled the amount of shelter on our streets over the course of the last five years, and we've responded with additional support during the COVID crisis. It's around transitioning people off the streets into housing, and it's about our commitment to permanent support of housing, which is aggressive uh, and connects people not just with housing, but the services that they need to be successful in that housing. For some, it's mental health services. For others, it's addiction treatment. For others, still, maybe it's domestic violence survivorship services or whatever. But where we need to really go from here on out is focusing on the street homeless crisis before us today. That means more shelter, more on-ramps to housing, getting people off the sidewalks. 
Number two, it means more focus on the chronically homeless. And we started that with our navigation centers that aren't just shelters, they also connect people with social services. And for those who won't come in, we've actually sent teams out into the field and in the years ahead, that's where the focus of our effort is going to be on street camping, getting people services and connecting those who really, really need a lot of support, the support they need to be successful either in shelter or housing. Thank you. Same question to you, Sarah. It's interesting because when you walk around Portland right now and talk to people, regardless of their neighborhood, they're not going to tell you that things feel like they've been getting better under the incumbent's uh, time in office. People tell me that they don't feel heard, that they don't feel as if their neighborhood feels like it's getting its needs met, and that they don't feel the solutions that they need are accessible and or that the mayor's office is particularly responsible to helping them get projects off the ground. I've heard this time and time again. And so what we really need then is someone who's coming at this from both ends of the spectrum. One, with a strategic plan to end our housing state of emergency. Since uh, then Mayor Hales uh, declared the housing state of emergency. We've not had a strategic plan in place to end the housing state of emergency, and we need that. And we need a progressive revenue process to help us understand where the money's coming from, how we're going to allocate it, and in what parts of the city. Uh, we also have not seen um, an, an aggressive attempt to deal with the displacement factor. The, dis the anti-displacement process is, is in place, but it's not going along as quickly as it needs to. We've not seen a closure on the minority homeownership gap under the incumbent. And we have not seen a plan to stabilize schools. Again, we have certain schools, especially in East Portland, that have uh, high turnover rates. And so we need to intensify investments so that we can shore up our schools. And we need a systematic approach to dealing with this crisis. Thank you. Our next question is on Portland Parks and Recreation. Sarah, what do you see as current and future challenges and possible long-term solutions? Well, ultimately, the biggest challenge that we hear time and again is a sustainable funding mechanism for parks and recreation. I, I find it interesting that there's always money uh, for tear gas and, uh, you know, riot squads, but we always have to figure out how we're going to scrape enough money together to pay for education and recreation facilities. Uh, this is something that Portlanders need to grapple with. We need to decide whether or not we uh, want to uh, take on something like Seattle has taken on, where they set up a special parks district, whether we want to think about how we can uh, affect better outcomes through things like voting in universal pre-K, which is on the ballot this November, and making sure that we're co-locating things like uh, green jobs that are caring jobs and education jobs alongside our existing parks and recreation facilities, how we could be using the community resources more effectively as safety hubs, uh, neighborhood help centers, especially through the end of crisis and uh, the end of COVID crisis and beyond. It really is about a creative rethinking of how these facilities and activities function not just in our city from a recreation perspective but from an economic perspective and whether or not we are going to commit to funding them sustainably ultimately to making sure that those workers are cared for um, and that we're not cutting parks jobs even as we're increasing uh, police budgets is something that I hear from the public time and again that they want. Thank you. Ted same question to you on parks and recreation. Yes, yeah, so uh, as the Parks Commissioner, after the, the passing of my good friend and colleague, Nick Fish, uh, I continued the work that he had done along with the rest of the council around finding that sustainable path to funding. Uh, there is actually a ballot measure on the November ballot. It's a levy. We looked at all options, including a district. And as a council, we concluded that the levy was the right way to go. Uh, or at least a majority on the council reached that conclusion. I certainly concluded that. And if the voters support it in November, we will have sustainable funding for the Parks Bureau. So I would encourage all of us, including my opponent, to support that. Uh, but let's also be honest about the city resources. My opponent has now said three times in the first few minutes of this debate that we've increased funding for the police. It's just not true. The fact is, because of the COVID reductions, I asked the Portland Police Bureau to take a $14 million reduction in the proposed budget. My colleagues and I then added another $12 million in reductions. So we have almost $30 million in real reductions since the last budget. 
And the budget isn't completely balanced yet, so we're still asking for about three and a half million dollars of reductions. Uh, my opponent is right, though. I believe in reform, in better policing, hiring, retention, and directive practices. Uh, but at the end of the day, just cutting the police could, in fact, end up having negative consequences. We need resources for training. We need re uh, resources to end gun violence in our community. The behavioral health unit, which goes out and works with people. I'm that, sorry to interrupt you. Right? Thank you. Uh, we need to continue to expand and support those operations, too. So let's not get cut into this idea that just slashing a budget necessarily gives you better community services. It doesn't always work that way. Thank you. Our next question is on the Climate Action Plan. How would you rate the city's progress in meeting the goals of the Climate Action Plan? What further steps does Portland need to take to meet these goals? It, is that for me? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, so my administration has been very aggressive. We were the first administration nearly on day one to commit the city to 100% renewable energy. We passed the clean air construction standard, which reduces diesel particulates in our air, and it serves as a great national example of what cities can do around clean air. My administration blocked Zenith from turning Portland into a fossil fuel exporting hub for Canada, and we didn't do it in a knee-jerk way. We did it legally and thoughtfully so that it's going to stick. That will reduce the number of oil trains going through the Columbia River Gorge and through our populated neighborhoods. We passed the single-use plastics ordinance to reduce the amount of plastic going into our landfill uh, and our waterways. We expanded the demolition ordinance to make sure that toxics weren't getting into the air. We thought about the built environment. The 2035 Central City Plan, which we passed under my leadership, has significant environmental and transportation options, which I think improve the climate. The residential infill program was just passed, the emergency declaration was done uh, with the support of the community, and that's why the Oregon League of Conservation Voters has endorsed me in this race. Thank you. Sarah, same question to you on the Climate Action Plan. You know, honestly, this is such an interesting time as we just come out of being unable to breathe when we went outside of our houses due to our state being on fire and the entire west coast uh, being essentially ablaze when you look at the urgency of the crisis ahead of us the distinctions even in our endorsers are pretty clear the sunrise youth young people are rallying behind my campaign because they see me as a climate champion i'm someone who um, has been able to work on things at the community level, for instance, the residential infill project, which would stemmed from community, uh, the power to pass that ultimately in council came from community. And so when you look at the things that we're going to have to do in the future uh, to prepare for the climate crisis ahead, it really is going to be community-led initiatives that are going to get us there. Um, I am the only candidate running on a Green New Deal for Portland that has our economic prosperity tied to our climate resiliency and climate justice. And so what we need to ask ourselves is this, what are the costs of not doing more faster when we are facing climate disaster and potentially inhabit a, in a, a planet that's no longer um, inhabitable for future generations? We need to take this seriously. Our reputation um, as a global leader is irrelevant if we're not shored up with good policy for our people. And so I encourage uh, viewers to go visit my Green New Deal for our Portland at sarah2020.com. Thank you. Next up is land use. To you, Sarah, there's an inherent tension between identifying sufficient industrial and employment lands and preserving critical open space in natural areas. Where do you stand on this conflict and on the city's anticipated update of its economic opportunities analysis? We can get creative here. You know, how we are manufacturing things is changing. Uh, there are different kinds of industries, so there could be greater nuance um, in our industrial land use zoning uh, with regard to light manufacturing, uh, being co-located with other land uses. Uh, that's not the same as we have to do with other industrial land uses. We can think about retrofitting. Uh, the city has six golf courses. 
uh, that now are not in the black. And so what would it mean for us to rethink some of those properties for say housing where we could move other uh, land uses around? What would it mean for us to look at say opportunity zones where we could be doing um, investments in uh, recycling and materials innovation, especially in East Portland, creating jobs through these uh, rethinkings of land use. So I believe it's well within Portland's capacity to deal with this situation, but we need to be creative about it. Uh, we need to work with our community partners, especially frontline communities that we're, we're uh, foregrounding their needs in urban space and making sure that we're, we're investing in a sustainable economy locally, uh, closing the, the loop on our resource and materials consumption, and ultimately incorporating that as part of our climate action planning and our economic development planning uh, simultaneously. Thank you. Ted, same question to you. Well, I'm really happy with the work my administration has already done on this front, the work we're doing with my colleagues on the city council and our community partners. Uh, first of all, it's about thoughtful infill. Uh, we have not had an infill strategy that even comports with modern standards used by other cities. Until we passed the residential infill, there were many areas of the city where you couldn't put a duplex or a triplex or a garden apartment or anything else, things that are taken for granted in other major metropolitan areas. That came on the heels of the Better Housing by Design and the Central City 2035 plan, which allow for thoughtful infill and density in areas where it's most appropriate. Then when it comes to the question of industry, Industry is changing. We're, we're already a city with a brand around innovation, creativity, technology, thoughtfulness, and we have all of these great opportunities around the green economy, which my administration is already capitalizing on. Uh, first of all, 80% of the buildings that are here today are going to be here in 20 years. So there's a lot of opportunity around uh, retrofitting those buildings for energy efficiency, same with electric vehicles, uh, infrastructure, charging, stations, maintenance, all of these things are really good job opportunities going forward. And we're committed to working with industry partners, whether it's our utilities, whether it's Portland Community College or others, and we're finding on-ramps for job training and education to prepare people not only for this shift towards greener industries in our community, but higher paying good solid jobs that'll come with it. And we're making sure that we lead with equity to make sure those who've been hit hardest by climate change actually benefit first from the opportunities around our changing economy. Thank you. You get the next question, Ted. If elected, how would you use your position as mayor to help end racism, remedy the legacy of discrimination in our community, and advance racial equity in Portland? I think the most important thing a mayor of any individual city can do is lead by example. And I said when I ran the last time that I would have the most diverse administration in the history of this city, and I have. I had the first African-American man serve as my chief of staff, as uh, the first chief of staff for this administration. I made sure that in our hiring and our recruiting practices for city leadership, that we put an equity lens on everything. And you'll remember when I was hiring a police chief, I said, understanding the systemic racism that has existed in our community for decades has an impact on policing and community sensibilities today. And I took a lot of heat from people back then, but I think in retrospect, people realized I was absolutely on the right course. Then it's about the way we do everything, whether it's housing and supporting uh, community efforts like the North Northeast Housing Coalition, whether it's around economic development and having the first community benefits agreement in the Broadway corridor as we build our first central city uh, neighborhood from scratch with the first community benefits agreement, or by literally turning over development opportunities to people in the community like we did with the North Russell, North Williams site in the historic Albina neighborhood or even the work that we're doing in other parts around climate action. Uh, you know, my opponent has chided me for the delay in getting a climate emergency ordinance in front of us, but we delayed it in part so we could engage frontline communities and have them lead the effort, which they did. I need did. to interrupt you, and I'm so sorry. Those are the ways, you, you lead through example, not by talking about it. And Sarah, how would you use your position if elected as mayor to help end racism? and remedy the legacy of discrimination and advance racial equity. Yeah. 
we need to build trust in the community. It's not enough to have um, executive leadership um, in whether it's the mayor's office or a city bureau. We need to look at the diversity of our entire workforce, which at present is about 75% white for the city of Portland. We need to make explicit our goals with regard to hiring across our city. Uh, we need to make that open and accountable to the public, whether that's through dashboarding or other uh, feedback mechanisms so that we can be held accountable for our performance. Uh, programs like Portland Means Progress, which the mayor has uh, claimed as um, a success, has seen an, a net loss of black workers under that program. And so we need to actually be clear about what we're measuring and how we plan to get it. Um, progress Pro processes and projects languish under this administration, whether it's the Russell project, which again, there hasn't been remarkable progress made there. Um, hiring in the city, not remarkable progress. Even the climate declaration that he talks about in the fourth year of his administration. I understand the need to work with community, but taking years uh, to develop these things is not acceptable. And so we need to act with urgency, um, accountability, transparency, and clear data. Thank you. Looking ahead, what is your vision for the city of Portland in 2040? What actions would you take now to achieve that vision, Sarah? This is where it's so important to lay out a clear plan for the people of Portland. And I'm so proud of what my campaign has accomplished on this front, whether it's our Green New Deal for Portland, which is a look at decarbonizing our economy, the Rethinking Public Safety Plan, which we published prior to the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd, which was a combination of demilitarization and decriminalization to help us meet our public safety goals more efficiently and humanely. My Housing for All Plan, which involves a strategic look at housing supply, access to opportunity, access to home ownership, and how we're gonna fund that through progressive taxation, or even my good government plan, where you look at how we can engage in the upcoming charter review process to create a healthy democracy that's inclusive, that's representative, that in, is um, a civic powerhouse, if you will, as that can actually be our first responder in times of crisis, as we saw in the recent wildfires or in the, um, protests where we have a community that is able to come together to protect each other, to protect our, um, our habitat and our environment, and ultimately to shore up our city against threats, um, natural, human, economic, and otherwise. And so my vision of Portland is one that is safe for everyone, where everyone has a place to call home, where everyone has something they can do when they need help, and where we are equal and able to realize our best selves with access to opportunity. Thank you. Ted, what is your vision for the city in 2040? Portland already has an amazing portfolio. We're seeing nationally, we're seeing globally as a city where people are creative, they're innovative, they're welcoming, they're inclusive. This is a city of leaders and we've led in so many different directions, whether it's economic prosperity, whether it's the climate, whether it's efforts uh, around housing or livability. And of course, we're, we're a place that people want to be just by virtue of the fact that we're close to nature and we're in a beautiful part of the world. But our city is becoming more complex. It's becoming more diverse. And where we need to be by 2040 is everybody needs to be able to see themselves here in this community. They need to feel like they have a stake of ownership, that their voice matters, that their concerns are being heard. And I wanna make sure that we become one of those handful of cities that people look to, to be able to bring people together to get it right. We'll be prosperous, we'll be clean, we'll be safe. We will have a good education system. We'll have advanced access to education and job training. And importantly, we're gonna have a government that works. At the end of the day in 2040, I want people to have pride that they are part of Portland, Oregon, that they are part of our community, and that they feel that they have a strong stake in the future of this community by working together with others to make it happen. Thank you. Ted, how do you see the mayor's role as the face of Portland, representing the city in regional, 
state, national, and international venues? Well, you know, here's an area where I think Sarah and I may agree. Maybe. We'll see. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, I represent the community. It's not about me. And, and even more so when we have a weak mayor form of government, uh, where I'm once to, one of many decision makers, that the power of the mayor is in convening, it's in facilitating, it's in lifting and hearing the voice of the community. And when I go around the country, or indeed around the world, to talk about the incredible things we're doing here, uh, I always talk about how the community leads, and that's what's unique about Portland. All of the best ideas we have in the community, whether it's residential infill, whether it's the climate action, uh, whether it's work we're doing around housing, whether it's our community benefits agreements around community prosperity, all of these things don't come out of my head or from the city council or from Sarah's head or anyone else. They come from the community. These are movements that have been in place for a long time because of the DNA of this community. And it's the job of the mayor to speak and give voice to what our community is doing and how we're innovating, how we're creating, and how we're leading. And that's the inspiring story of Portland outside of the, the current crisis. People see us as a can-do community, as a community that leads. And they listen to what's happening in the city of Portland because they know we innovate based on community engagement. So uh, I, I wanna continue to do that. It's not about me. I'm merely a reflection of the excellence that's already here in the city of Portland amongst our residents. Thank you. Sarah. What about you? Will you repeat the question again for me? How would you use your position as mayor? Excuse me. How do you see the mayor's role as the face of Portland, representing the city in regional, state, national, and even international arenas? That's such an interesting question. I worked the last decade uh, with Portland State University um, largely in that role as a de facto ambassador and policy uh, broker for city leaders from around the world who are coming here to seek the best that our city has to offer, uh, technological, uh, land use wise, uh, policy innovation, and yes, community innovation. And I've also uh, lectured extensively in uh, countries around the world on this topic. And what I've seen is actually an interesting shift over the past decade in how different mayors uh, see their role. Uh, you know, some mayors take a very aggressive approach internationally, marketing, as we saw under Mayor Sam Adams. Uh, some mayors, like Mayor Potter, are very uh, close to home and work from the grassroots without having much of an external view. Uh, mayors like Mayor Hales uh, was a bit uh, in the middle. And I think that what we've seen lately is a not a high level of engagement across other levels of government uh, to engage in the policy deliberations and the policy leadership that we'd like to see. I'll use transit as a good example. Um, I see the, le the leader of Portland, the mayor of Portland, as someone who should be pro promoting something like fareless transit for all Portlanders uh, to meet our climate action goals. You would use that uh, bully pulpit as the mayor of Portland to push TriMet, Metro, and State of Oregon to help us realize those goals. But at the same time, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. At the same time, our mayor cut the youth paths for our, our, our youth in East Portland. And so that's, I think, where we can, we can start to bring those together. Thank you. We have one more question before your closing statements. And this is the question, Sarah, first to you. Many surveys and reports have documented declining trust in democratic institutions in our country. Do you agree? And if so, what would be your approach to rebuilding trust? This is a Great question, because for Portlanders, this is why I put forward that good government plan. I believe that without a trustworthy government uh, that's open and accountable, we are not going to be able to solve this problem. And that's why I'm so proud to be running as a publicly financed candidate in the Open and Accountable Elections Program, where every single one of my donations is capped at $250. I'm not taking any donations from uh, PACs or corporations. There's no dark money in my campaign. And every single one of those, those donations is available on a public a website. Unlike my opponent, um, who resisted campaign finance reforms, took very large uh, contributions in the primary, um, and is now even having a challenging time working within the new campaign finance landscape. 
If we cannot focus on the very basics, public records requests, open and accountability, open and accountable communications with the public, making sure that our Office of Civic Engagement um, and our participatory mechanisms are inclusive and um, equitable, we are not going to be able to face our biggest challenges. So we need someone who's focused on citywide unity building, who can bring people together in, in neighborhoods and outside of neighborhoods, across sectors, across um, parts of this community to work on solving our biggest challenges. I believe that that's how you rebuild the trust in community. Thank you. Ted, same question to you. I think the poison that has trickled down from the Trump administration runs so deep that people don't even realize when they're being divisive. I mean, my opponent just gave this great speech about bringing us together and collaborating but as I said, we're 80% a small business community. Those are all corporations. And my colleague here just took a slam at them and said, I'm beholden to them. But they're an important constituency. They employ 80% of us. And a lot of those businesses are owned and operated by people of color. And to just dismiss them as, quote, corporations, unquote, doesn't speak well to bringing us together. And I realize this federal administration has singled me out for an investigation and potential arrest because they disagree with my politics. We need to move beyond this. A mayor needs to articulate a clear vision for the community and govern with an eye to the future. That doesn't mean ignore the crises of the day, but you've got to govern with an eye to the future. And then ultimately to build trust, do what you say you're going to do and explain to the public what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, have clear outcomes in mind. And you know what, if you're screwing up, be honest about it and let people know that you're evolving and you understand things. And I haven't done everything perfectly either as the mayor of the city and I've been really honest about it. And I think that kind of honesty and integrity and lifting up vision from the community and continuing to help lead us towards a less divisive, more inclusive future is the way we're going to slowly but surely rebuild trust in government. I still believe government's a force for great good in this community. Thank you. I'm not going to abandon that goal just because of the short-term politics of the moment. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us today and taking time to respond to our questions. It's so important for the voters to hear from you directly and understand your thinking and your plans. We're very grateful for your taking the time. It's now time for closing remarks, and Ted, you go first. Well, I'll just start by stating the obvious. Uh, I'll, I'll finish where I left off. Uh, I believe government is a force for great change in the community. I believe I have the opportunity to bring solutions to complex problems, and I believe my style is such that I can help bridge the divides that are separating us, uh, not only as a community, but as a nation. And you as voters, you have to decide who's best suited to lead during a time of crisis. And uh, who's going to make those decisions? Uh, the next mayor is going to define the next city council. And I believe this community for decades to come. I've served as your Multnomah County chair. I've served as your state treasurer. I've served as your mayor for the last four years. And I have a proven record of bringing people together to get things done. We have record affordable housing under my leadership of the Housing Bureau. We have doubled the number of emergency shelters for, for the people who are really struggling on our streets over the last five years or, or so. Uh, we have engaged in unparalleled action and accomplishment around climate action and protecting our environment. On the COVID recovery, we've been strong, we've been early, we've been decisive, and we've been helpful to both households as well as businesses. And we have advanced equity in ways that no prior administration has ever done. And that's why I'm supported by every single labor union that's made an endorsement in this race, public or private sector, like SEIU. They represent the people uh, who work in healthcare, who are custodial staff, the people who engage in serious, uh, security, the UFCW, those are food workers. Uh, these are hardworking people in our community. They want me to lead. In our city unions, they've endorsed me because they want me to continue to come and lead the city. So I'm gonna do my best. I'm asking you for your support. Please visit tedwheeler.com and remember to vote. And I appreciate your time today in the League of Women Voters for putting this forum on today. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, your closing statement, two minutes. 
Thank you very much. And yes, thank you uh, to the League of Women Voters for hosting this important conversation. It is a critical time in our city's history. And I do ask uh, viewers today to pause and think for a moment, how does the city feel like it's doing? Are we on the right track? When was the last time you felt like Portland was on the wrong track, was on the right track, if you feel like we're on the wrong track now? Uh, was it under this administration? My answer is that we're not on the right track. And in fact, that we need different leadership to get us back on track. Um, the choice this election is between more of the same or progress. And I believe that someone like me, who's not a typical politician, who doesn't represent a long line of politicians whose broken promises have kept us stuck, um, is an alternative that we should uh, be excited about. And the fact that I am qualified and ready to lead Portland right now, uh, based in community, bringing the best of our city together with strategic plans to help us realize our bold visions. This is what's important right now. And what I'm offering is a rethinking of what brand Portland even is. It's not about appealing to outsiders. It's not about whether the New York Times thinks we're quirky. It's about whether every single Portlander has access to the very best quality of life that they can imagine here and how we're going to do that together. So I believe that this is a chance for us to elect a new kind of leader, to put the focus back on quality of life for every single Portlander and not just the big businesses, not small businesses that have controlled the mayor's office. I'm a community powered publicly financed candidate. I don't work for special interests. I work for the people of Portland and I'm asking you for your vote in November. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes today's forum. We thank our candidates for their participation and audience members, please share this video with your friends and family so that they too can have uh, information and be effective voters in this mayoral race. We all need to be well informed. This recording and other information about these candidates will be available on vote411.org through election day. Ballots will be mailed beginning October 14th. The last day to register is October 13th. As with all Oregon elections, go Oregon, it is mail-in only. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. Postmarks do not count. To, get your, to be sure that your ballot is received at the elections office, please mail it in the prepaid envelope by October 27th. After that date, after October 27th, please find a drop-off location near you. You can find that at vote411.org or in your voters pamphlet. This is Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please remember your vote counts. Thank you.